<laughs> okay. Um, you know, when you when you talk about how you how your style, I think what you're saying is that you adapted to what the markets were doing um, as time went by. Is that what you're saying? Well, here's here's actually my style now is exactly the same thing as it was in the 80s and the 90s and every decade. And what I do is I've always divided my trading into four profit centers. So, or programs, I'll call them programs because as a CTA, when you put together a disclosure document for a client, you must define and describe what you do. It doesn't mean that you have to give away your strategies. Uh -huh. Are you a trend follower? Are you doing yes. spread trades? And, and people really should do this exercise for themselves. Pretend that they are raising money and they are presenting their program to a client. Can they explain what they do? That it's, it's a consistent program with an edge and this is how they're going to make money for the client. So a simple answer would be a trend following system or a volatility breakout system. I mean, those are very simple answers. So my program is, the first bucket is trading S&Ps because I traded them the very first day they were listed and I felt like I always had a good handle on that. And when I first went upstairs, and again, we didn't have charts, every five minutes I would write down the ticks, I would write down the trin, I would write down the price of the bonds, I would write down the price of the S&Ps and I would do this all day long and I'd sort of draw out a little line chart as the day progressed. And so I got to know it so intimately that I mean it was just it's always been my best market. And then program two is sort of the in one day, out the next day. So it could be strategies like the volatility breakout system where you're entering on range expansion after, say, for example, the market has had two to three days of tight coiling, and then you're ready to jump in whichever way it starts breaking out. Perhaps you could use something as simple as, you know, it takes out the first hour high and that's your entry trigger or a range expansion function. Toby Craybell popularized this, doing the range expansion off the opening price. Um, Larry Williams did a lot of strategies in the uh, 80s and 90s along this way. I also... Um, used the two period rate of change, which I do every day on the daily charts and this Taylor approach. Okay. You know, a buy day, sell day, sell short day, which is really saying if you're in an uptrend, you wait for a high or low day. And then that sets up a buy day the next day, you know, <laughs> it's not mm -hmm. a perfect science, but that was my program too. Pretty much a holding time of one to three days. And then program three, um, were my, trades based off daily and weekly charts. So if you had a two month long triangle formation, you know, and, and it broke out, you know, perhaps you could put on a position and, and hold that for two to three weeks. So they were more position trades. Um, some would be held for two to three months. And then lastly, I had program four, which was something that couldn't necessarily be quantified because I do a lot of modeling and I do like to try to quantify, um, you know, where I have an edge, but, um, you know, it might be a seasonal trade. It might be when the put call ratios got really extreme and the sentiment got extremely bearish or extremely bullish. I'd go in and buy, um, a lot of call spreads or, or puts, you know, things along those lines, or perhaps there was a stock, you know, that was totally capturing everybody's attention and super heavy volume and was offering a unique opportunity. Well, I would want to give myself freedom to play that, but I had to put it in that program for, and then what I do is each quarter, I do the statistics program one, two, three, four, and I see, okay, where were my profits coming from the majority of the profits this quarter you know if i find that and i know the here's a funny thing well it's not funny it's true if you are day trading say for example the s and p's you know i can get a win rate of say 85 percent 
but if I'm making trades in program three, I know that my win-loss ratio there might only be 50% because it's a longer holding time and different, a higher time frame. And I know that program two, my in one day, out the next type of day, tends to run about 66%. You know, so if I see that the trade frequency is varying or my statistics are getting skewed, um, then something's wrong. Then I can say, oh, gosh, I really need a vacation. I'm just over trading or, you know, I'm getting yeah. too opinionated here on this market, you know. So it's I have to have a way that I can be accountable to myself and say, you know, let me examine and see you know, if I'm running on course like I should be, you know, um, so that's that's just a little way of, of um, you know, being responsible to myself. Okay, so that is how you evaluate your performance, right? Like look at the measures of skewness and... Yeah, you know, I don't really look at, um, it's funny because I try not to look at the P&L. Really do best if I don't look at the PL till the end of the month um, because I want to play my game. You know, I want to play my game, and I know that if I play my game, the numbers will work out. You know, it's like playing a card game or, or poker. You can't start, you know, or, or bridge. Some, some hands you might be dealt, they're just not great hands, you know, but you have to play them out. And um, that could be true with the market environment, you know, it could just be a really choppy, lousy market environment or the volumes could be off. You know, generally, I think most traders make most professional traders will make the most amount of money when you have heavy volumes and extreme volatility. That's where the opportunity is. But it could just be dull, chop, chop, noisy, noisy, consolidating market. So I try not to look at the P&L and I just know if I just keep playing my game you know, don't over trade or get frustrated. Uh, you know, I know a few things do line up each month, you know, in one of the programs and um, just put blinders on. OK, today my job is just to execute my plan today. And sometimes it's a wasted day. Not much happens. And then the next day, you do all my homework and preparation tonight. And the next day, okay, my job is to execute my plan and, you know, and see if I can capitalize on some of these things, you know, today. You know, okay. You just do that one day at a time. So it's like a Bayesian approach, you know, of each new piece of information the market gives you, you can then update your model or, you know, the, the style that you're following. Okay, very good. Uh, so with the four programs that you trade sort of, and these are, you know, different kind of programs, what would you say is the role that you cannot compromise on when you're trading all of them? Well, first of all, <laughs> the rule is don't trade all of them at once and don't get too many positions on because then, you know, um, you don't end up doing anything well. You, there are limits as to what you can manage. And when I was trading my full program, full to blast, you know, I had two people um, as assistants and I, I couldn't have done as many markets or as big a size without help. Like I don't like execution, you know, so I had one person that would just be doing my execution. I could say, Judd, put in a stop here, Judd, exit this, da, 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 you know, um, because otherwise I find that I make mistakes, you know, I, if I try to do too many things. And actually, as I've gotten older, I feel like I need to not try to do as many things. So, um, what I do is I do my preparation and plan for every market the next day. And some markets there might not be a great player set up and then I just, you know, make a little squiggle. So, but I might have eight markets lined up with great opportunity, but then I end up just trading two of them because you can't do them all. But you want to identify where is the low-lying fruit, you see? Where is the low-lying fruit? Are there any little cherries that can get picked off? And sometimes there aren't, but if you do your homework, you'll find usually there's something that's compelling. And then the S&Ps, I just am really aware of 
levels, you know, okay, what are the levels to the upside that we could trade to? What are levels to the downside that we could trade to? What is realistic? Am I expecting a little bit of consolidation, uh, a little bit of rotation, or are we poised to, uh, you know, do a markup, a new markup? Um, so the S&Ps, I always try to keep an open mind. Um, there's periods where I do really well putting on a trade in the first 15 minutes. Actually, I like trading before the market opens because the DAX leaves a really pretty nice rhythm. And sometimes you can almost trade the S&Ps off a pattern in the DAX. Um, but then there's other times where I feel like I do best if I wait for the first hour to pass. So I don't have any hard and fast rules other than don't get too many positions on and then the only other thing would be there's periods where I feel like okay I'm pushing it I'm pushing it either I just have had some really great you know fortune in capturing stuff or I feel I'm starting to over trade a little bit and you know about once a once a every two three weeks I hit the flatten button you know <laughs> this is like I'll have like too many things going on I'm like okay Let's let's flatten everything, and uh, and then I and then I uh, assess and regroup. I say, okay, I know I'm locked in everything here. I really liked that copper. I'm going to put that back on. You know, I try not to do that because you have horrible slippage and and bad vig when um, you do that too frequently. But it's a really good mechanism every once in a while to prove to yourself that you are not married to any one position or market or one side of that market. Just prove it. Just flatten everything and just prove that you're not married to anything. So. Mm. I really love you, you know, how you respond to these questions. Uh, I think I, before we get to the psychology bit of it, the psychology bit of trading, you have heard um, you have interacted with a lot of people in your trading journey. You have hired a lot of assistants and interns. Have you impacted them in their life? Have they become traders, successful traders if they have? And, you know, because I know trading isn't for everyone. So how do you balance it off even with your, um, I don't know, would you... Um, I don't want to. That's say a good question. That, you know, that's but, a very yeah. good question. Um, I would say that uh, none of the interns, pure interns that I've ever had work for me, went on to become successful traders. But honestly, most of them didn't aspire to be a successful trader. They enjoyed it. Um, they were good at it, but it wasn't going to be the road for them. And I mentioned two or three of them in the book who went on to do really interesting, fascinating things. But um, I don't think that trading was their calling. It was just an enjoyable uh, excursion for them to do for a year or two out of school. Um, the I had three people work for me with my fund that I can tell you one is not in the business anymore although he was I think one of the best traders that I um, that I've seen but he had two kids and he had a family and um, without the uh, safety net of you know a lucrative paycheck because I was you know I gave everybody a percentage of the profits I think he felt instead of trying to make it on his own actually he and another uh, fellow had left and tried to form their own fund and it just wasn't very profitable so he went on into another different business um, Nigel who's in the book still trades um, he doesn't have any children or any family or any responsibility and he has the luxury of doing that and he has money set aside that he can do that with and he is 100% mechanical so what he does works for him um, and then I had two people work for me that were already, uh, they had been on the trading floor for years and were off the floor. I know that they do their own thing and still trade. So uh, 
that's a mixed question. You know, I would say none of the young people that worked for me went on to become traders, but I'm not sure that they aspired to either. You know, one gal, she was so smart. You know, she hadn't even finished college, but she could do math like, you know, 10 times faster and, and better than I could. She was just a genius. Um, but she, you know, ended up, you know, being in a relationship and now she has a baby and, you know, she just chose to do other things with her life. I mean, she has a job, but you can't necessarily do those things. You know, if you're a female and you want to start a family, you're not going to be a full-time trader. It's tough. It's very, very, very tough. Your job is to be a mommy. So I did have a kid, but I was really fortunate because my husband was Mr. Mom. So he did the grocery shopping, he did the cooking, you know, and I did the trading and, and I would not have been able to do everything that I did without having a partner help carry the weight on some of those other tasks in life. So that's really important. You need to assess your support network, you know, if you have other people in your life. Yeah, that's true. And um, in the book, you talk about, you know, an effective way of developing and training traders. Um, can you explain about the OODA loop a little oh, bit? Yes. Um, that was a little experiment that I did with, um, I have a friend who was up at MIT, um, Andrew Lowe, who's been a teacher up there for many years in finance. And... Brett Steenberger was also friends with those guys. So we did a project trying to assess learning and um, if you can teach people to learn and if there were certain personality traits among the winning traders versus the losing traders, right? Wouldn't everybody love to know that? <laughs> yeah. So Uda was a slogan. You can look it up on the um internet, anybody that's interested, O-O-D-A, which is Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. And it was an acronym for fighter pilots because they need to make decisions quickly. They may not have all the information to make their decisions, but they need to act. And that was very much how it is, you know, when we were down in the trading pits, you don't know if a broker's coming in and if he's going to buy or sell or how much, you know, but we have to quickly think on our feet and accommodate the order flow. And so um, I had 60 traders online and all of them had a little, you know, um, thing where they would fill out at the end of the day their trades, their um you know, how, how they did and so forth. And here was a simple exercise. I would give a point where, say, for example, the S&Ps are trading. I'd say, okay, the S&Ps are trading at 27.07. You have a buy stop at 27.10. So now if it trades 27.10, the trader assumes that they're long and they can do whatever they want with that trade. They can exit it immediately they can scratch it you know they can um trail a stop they can play for four ticks but they have to write down at the time exactly what they're doing see so okay so now i'm long 27 10 i'm a little nervous because it's at the top of the swing maybe i'm just gonna quit blocking two ticks and i'm flat and then i write down on my sheet i took two ticks you know um or the the market's trading 2707 you're working a bid at 2702. Now, if the market sells off and it hits 2702, how are you going to manage that trade? Do you want to keep it? Or do you think the market can bounce back up? Do you want to put in a stop on that? So, and then you you write down it, you know, what did you have your outcome for that day with these trades that somebody else was saying where you're getting in and how you're getting in. And like I said, you can immediately get out, you know, you enter it and then just immediately offer it back out if you don't like it. But you do 10 of those a day, you know, or eight of those a day. And it forces you to learn on the spot, you know, <laughs> manage the trade. It increases the intensity. You're watching the tape. You're completely engrossed in the market and the action. It's, it's better than a video game, you see. And so you do that for two months. And I guarantee, I guarantee anybody out there would be a better trader. 
you know, I, I should put together a program one of these days like that just for kicks, but, um, you know, it's still a lot of work and time and energy. So we did find, we did a, several experiments and we did find that in terms of emotional composition, that there was a, an experience bias, like everybody when they're in the markets for one or two years, of course, is more adrenaline, more emotion, more uncertainty, more anxiousness, and you know, a lot of different things. But then you take somebody that's been trading for 20 years, and it's like, you know, you can put a heart monitor on them and like make them do a hundred law, and they're not even going to blink. You know, it's just like you just get desensitized to everything. And then that's what also makes you a better trader, is you don't make decisions out of an emotional component and you've probably learned where you're going to have cognitive biases as well that could trip you up but so it was it was an interesting thing i couldn't say at the end of it what type of person would make a better trader or not because the newer traders were you know a lot more emotional and sensitive and that's just the way it is so how do you get around the cognitive biases in your decision making process that is so important because there's been so much awareness in the last 10 years of all these cognitive biases there's some really hysterical memes if you go googling on the internet you know and see the pictures on you know hindsight bias confirmation bias you know all these things i would suggest that everybody read up on them oh and then the best is the bias Oh, but none of those things refer to me. <laughs> you know? Of course, I know what hindsight bias is, but I never do that, you know, so it's very funny. Um, the best thing that you can do is have a consistent process. And even though it's extremely difficult to create a mechanical system that's going to make money, if it were possible everybody would be doing it so it's very difficult but um you can still model things and and see where there's an edge and then treat your trading as if it is a system and it, it there's flexibility in the rules and there's gray areas and and so forth but you need to really strive for one consistent style that you practice and I don't care what it is it could be a market profile and by George you're just going to do the profiles every day and the value areas and calculate the little statistics and things you can do that you know or you are strictly going to be a breakout trader and you know wait for little uh, chart formations that meet your specific criteria but you need to treat it as a specific system a wonderful exercise for people is to at some point in their life trade a volatility breakout system there's many of them it's easy to create they will all have a very small edge probably not enough to make a living but you will make money over time with them and the wonderful thing about them is that they have very hard and fast rules um they're not comfortable to trade i personally despise trading them <laughs> but I have learned a lot from trading them and you know if you could approach your business like that I think everybody would be a better trader for it all right um you know as traders we tend to think sometimes think too much uh but what would you say about how you handle the fact that we cannot or we are so limited in our ability to forecast and predict the future. I don't think you have to predict the future. This is not about predicting the future. I don't think anybody can predict where a trade is going to go, but you can assess pretty easily if you're in an uptrend or a downtrend or if there's a pullback in that trend or what the weekly charts look like or if you're you know radically oversold in terms of sentiment i mean these are sort of basic technical things that every trader should be familiar with so um i don't know what what was the other rest of your question um it's, you've answered pretty much 
that okay. we cannot predict the future. That's <laughs> That's okay. So uh, I you, think you, I think you, you know the biggest the the second part of that is patience. You know I think that people underestimate the patience that it takes to wait for a real recognizable signal, and your best signals are going to come when there's an increase in volume, or let me say your best opportunity or your best pattern, and. I can sit here all day long watching, watching, waiting, waiting for one recognizable trade and then make that trade. But I don't think a lot of people can do that. And I think there's a really big issue with um, the social media and, you know, people are on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. They're on Twitter all day or they're looking at Twitter. You can't concentrate on the markets if you're looking at Twitter. I mean, <laughs> I think I've made like 20 tweets in my entire life, you know, but I started to make up one or two funny ones because I was really bored the other day and I put in a funny one and I don't <laughs> think everybody got it. I don't think anybody got it's, it. It's 49 <laughs> in total. I, I just checked your Twitter. It's 49 tweets. So they do say that, you know, when you play with your phone your cell phone or check your email or all those things in our brain it gives a little squirt of dopamine right so it's addicting yeah. it's very addicting and um same thing when your hand is on the mouse and you click and make a trade it gives you a squirt of dopamine i bet people didn't even know that but it does so it's like a gambling it's a, it's an addiction so if you really want to improve your concentration skills concentration is like a muscle you must exercise it and it gets better every day. Here are my tricks. I never open my email till lunchtime. I don't have Twitter up and I leave my cell phone in the kitchen. Okay. And then the best thing is that I go on to YouTube and I have, you know, they have these binaural beats, like these concentration um, yeah. things that go on for two to three hours. And so for the first three, four hours of the morning, I put on one of those little concentration uh, music things with the binaural beats and it just keeps you focused and it's wonderful. And then in the afternoon, I put on um, Pandora, like all my chill lounge music, you know, <laughs> yeah. and listen to that. That's really good. It, it even helps you in like when you're meditating and then you listen to that kind of music, it really calms you down. I love that. Ah. So uh, we're almost winding up. What would you say, um, you know, the interesting developments that you see happening today in the modern day markets? And then at the end of your book, you say that the markets haven't really changed that much. So how is that possible, especially with the new, new, you know, this algorithmic trading, there are more derivative products that have come on board in the markets. What's your response to that? Well, first of all, you could, I could take a chart today and cut off the, you know, the, the margins of it. So you didn't know the time frame, you didn't know the levels, you didn't know the top of it and show you a chart. And I could show you a chart from 20 years ago and I could show you a chart from 40 years and you would not be able to tell me which one was the one for today, you know, assuming it was like a liquid market that was trading. I mean, the patterns are the same, you know, and a yeah. lot of times there aren't patterns, you know, there's just a lot of noise. People have to recognize that it's really learning to discern when to stay out of the noise. Um, I have some good examples in my book, you know, and you can see quite clearly doesn't matter if it's in the 90s or or in the last five years you know there's periods of noise and there's periods of exceptional opportunity so the market's either going up or they're going down or they're consolidating I mean nothing has changed in terms of that now not to be flippant about it what has changed is the overall noise level so because we have broadband and it's not the algorithms per se but it's just that everybody's smart these days. Everybody sees the same thing at exactly the same moment, at exactly the same time. And how is, you know, everybody has their little buy stops in or the same game. So it, it, when a market does break out, it will tend to move very efficiently, a very efficient markup without as many little flags or pauses that it would have had 20 years ago. Does that make sense? 
So yeah. now it's like, if you're not on board, it's very difficult to get on board unless you just say, I'm going to enter on the opening or enter on the close or enter at noon or just pay up or I'll just buy right here and it'll put half on. And then if it does back off, I'll buy the other half. You have to come up with some construct to get you into a market where the train has already left the station. And that's the power of understanding volatility breakout systems. And, and conversely, because you have so many different players, you've got commercials, you've got the fidelity, you know, hedge funds, you've got multi-billion dollar hedge funds, you have the algorithmic trading, you have so many different entities out there on different time frames, that that's what really creates the noise. I don't think the algorithms have changed the game for me. You know, I'm not trying to trade one minute bars, you know, if anything, you need them to provide liquidity. You know, in the old days, everybody used to accuse the specialists or the brokers or the floor traders of running stops, you know, and now they'll say, oh, well, the algorithms ran them. You know, it's, you'd be grateful for those algorithms because it'd be really difficult to trade if they didn't provide the liquidity that they do. And a lot of algorithms are execution order algorithms. So for example, let's say a fund wants to buy 100 million shares of a particular stock. It'll set an algorithm to do the execution like a VWAP routine or, you know, um, if I was trading, you know, as a CTA and I wanted to buy 300 coffee futures, which isn't necessarily the most liquid market, I would say, I want you to buy 300 coffee futures over the next 10 minutes. I want you to buy five on bid, you know, um, three, uh, you know, uh, you know, two seconds afterwards, you know, 23 contracts, you know, um, you know, on a buy stop. Like you just mix it all up so nobody can detect what your order is, and it's it gets you an average price. That's really the whole object is of an algorithm to get an average price for executing a large piece. Now, there's also strategic algorithms that are running, um, you know, little patterns as a human would, right? So they can detect a breakout, you know, that's all they're doing. Just pretend they're a bunch of little humans running around. They just don't make stupid mistakes like we do. Yeah. Um, you know, so many people take for granted uh, gratitude and I want to read an excerpt from chapter 12 of your book, um, trying to keep the ball in play. You say that there's nothing more maddening than to lose one's short-term memory and cognitive functions. This is what happened to me during this time. I learned to be grateful for every healthy day. Gratitude is a key ingredient of success. It means that even when bad things are happening, you always have something to focus on just like pilots have a gauge to make sure they can still tell which way is up. Gratitude keeps me from ever um, feeling upside down. When you're trading in the markets, you have to have a separate source of happiness to know that there's still wonderful things around, most of which do not require money. It's easier to take risks when you remove your personal happiness and well-being from the equation and then you say gratitude leads to optimism and a positive attitude is 90 percent of the game i find that so profound and can you just wrap things up with that you know as we conclude? yeah you're um there was a period where i had a um a severe immune um deficiency function and you know, I was like about two years, I was basically lying on my back. I, I couldn't hardly move. Um, so, you know, I recovered from that. But that was where I lost my short term memory. And a lot of, um, you know, it was just very, very frustrating. I couldn't even add two plus two. And um, so once, you know, I was able to be a normal human being again, you know, you're just so grateful for every day because you know how bad it was, you know. And this is like when my daughter was two. I couldn't even go outside and play with her. And, um, y you know, so after that, you're just, you know, you're, you're like, thank you, God. Thank you, God, you know. <laughs> you know, just, you know, and give thanks everywhere, every day. You know, it's funny because I grew up in a family of strong women. And my mom is always the type that would say, 
you can see the glass is half full or you can see the glass is half empty. You know, you can make lemonade out of lemons, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. I mean, I just grew up in a family like that. So, um, you know, my mom would preach to us, if you put a negative thought in your head, it will come to fruition. You know? So yeah. just being really aware of those things. And so it also puts it in the context that, Yes, trading on one hand is my life because everybody I know is in the markets. It's what I love. It's my passion. I enjoy talking about it. And I could sit in front of my screens 24-7. But on the other hand, it's a game. It's, it's a game. And when I walk out of my office, the game is closed. You know, you have to remove yourself from the game and your sense of worth has nothing to do with if you're profitable or not. And I think that's a very difficult thing for many people to get their hands around, especially when you're first starting out, because, you know, we like to think we're smart, you know, you work hard, you want to be rewarded for your efforts, you put in the time and energy, and you should have something to show for your, you know, productivity. And tradings, the markets are not that way, you know, it's like there's a random, you know, person up there like mixing things up on purpose to trick you, you know, <laughs> and so you can't take it personally. You, if everybody read this book and saw all the terrible things and the mistakes that I made, you know, and uh, trust me, they wouldn't feel badly at all because I've made every mistake in the book and it's it's very challenging. It's a very challenging business. So um, you do it first because you love it. And then, like anything in life, if you enjoy it, you know, eventually the consistent profitability uh, improves. So, and then All you're right. grateful. Yes, then your gratitude is like, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you, I did it. <laughs> yeah. And I think the best thing is to be grateful first to yourself and then, you know, you can appreciate everything else that you see around. Um, I never asked this to anyone before, so I'm just going to throw it out to you. Um, do you find that your social life revolves around your um, trader friends or you have a separate social life outside of your work? You know, my social life has always been um, my trader friends. For example, you know, my first husband, he had been on the trading floor. And my um, husband now, uh, Damon, he used to be my first S&P broker. Like when I was doing the S&Ps in 1990, you know, he would take my orders. And he was just a, a you know, a business um, contact for 15 years before we even actually went out. And um so I think it's been very helpful having always a spouse or a partner or mate uh, around. But I was single for 10 years and I didn't really date, but I had, you know, my um, two partners like I had in my hedge fund, um, the two people that worked for me. And then we would always also have one or two interns. And it was fun. You know, we would all go out to dinner together. We would all like have barbecues together. So, yes, that was your social life. It was a lot of fun because traders are very interesting people. You know, everybody has such unique personalities and most of them have pretty good senses of humor, too, which made it even more fun. But I also have um, always, you know, had the horses. So, you know, I'd always have a a trainer that I worked with or, you know, one or two people in the um, horse world. And then I always had a best friend at the gym, my trainer at the gym and Mr. Bill, there's a whole chapter in the book devoted to Mr. Bill and the lessons I learned from him. So um, that pretty much sums it up, you know. I've never really had a girlfriend that I could say, hey, let's go out and have coffee together. <laughs> I don't go shopping, you know, I just order everything on the internet, you know. Or when I when they didn't have the internet, my husband, I swear to God, my first husband, he would run out. And if I was going to go speak somewhere, he'd go buy me my nylons because I hated going into stores. <laughs> <laughs> so it worked somehow. It worked. <laughs> You're somewhat similar to me. Um, I would, I don't know, maybe one day I'll come and ride your horse. I don't know, we'll see. And uh, You must let me know if you come to the United States, absolutely. Yeah, you're interesting as well. I love your, you know, your humor. You might not see that you have it, but you do. And um, 
you know, the last thing, the last, this is the last thing. What, what would you say is your trading philosophy that you can pass on to traders, all types of traders? Well, I think it's very important that you do your own work and don't be influenced by anybody else or anybody else's opinions. I think that's the biggest evil out there. You have to do your own homework, come up with your own plan, look at the charts yourself because that way you truly know when it's working. I mean, there's a good part of the time I don't know if it's working or it's not working, but I will know, you know, when I've got it right. And then that's really important for jumping on. And if I listen to other people or I, I don't even have a TV in my office. I haven't had a TV in my office for 30 years because I don't want to hear anybody else because I feel like damned if I do, damned if I don't. And I will be the first to tell you that if I read something, it does influence me. It really does. So I have to protect myself from that. And people need to be really aware. Um, I don't know anybody making a great living trading who posts repeatedly on Twitter. It doesn't mean that there aren't people out there. I'm sure there are. Um, but I personally don't. And... I think there are some good people on Twitter for sure, but I can't begin to tell you how many people come up to me and say, oh, you know, when you're trading during the day, who do you follow on Twitter? <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? You know? Yeah. So um, just be really careful about that. You have to be able to do it completely on your own. No outside influences, just you and the charts and you must reach that point of being 100% making your own decisions. And it just takes time every day. Every day that you sit in front of the screen, you gain confidence. You gain a little bit more experience. You know, I know it's hard when you don't have another income stream coming in financially. But when I was on the trading floor, people would be surprised. Half those people that were floor traders they're bartending at night or they had a weekend job or, you know, um, I have some people I know that are good traders, but their spouse has a, a steady job, you know, with health benefits and things like that. So um, if you don't have those things, you know, it's just going to take a little bit of extra time and just have a lot of patience. There's a long learning curve. Yeah, Linda. Thank you. Bye. Let me go All for right. my moment. Bye.